Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. If I told you this morning that after service today, I was going to give anyone who met me down in the fellowship hall $10,000 cash, what would you think? How many of you would rush from your homes watching online (laughs) to get down to the fellowship hall? If you're anything like me, you'd probably think, yeah, right, $10,000, Pastor, maybe with Monopoly cash. I don't have $10,000 to give everybody in here. I think you know that full well. But what if Warren Buffett showed up this morning and said, I'm just feeling generous. Anybody who just comes down to the fellowship hall, I'll give you $10,000 cash. I don't know what you would think, but at least you would know in your head, at least he's got the cash to back it up. Maybe it's not going to happen, but I'll still go down to find out, because I know he could. Great faith is only as great as the object of faith. Faith placed in anything or anyone that perishes including money, is a faith that will perish, regardless of how great it is in this temporary dwelling place we have called earth. Great faith is only as great as the object of faith. And furthermore, faith itself owes its existence and substance to the faithfulness, integrity, and ability of its object to deliver what faith hopes for. It is not faith that makes something trustworthy. It is the existence of trustworthiness that creates faith. As evidenced by the fact that no one joined him and his family in his effort to build an ark, Noah built the ark not because there was any sign that an imminent storm and doom was coming, I assure you if there was, there would have been at least one other family probably on the boat. No, Genesis 6 tells us that God flooded the earth because when he saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. They didn't care. They didn't believe it was coming. No one was there to encourage Noah and help him build. But yet Noah built that ark faithfully, plank by plank, not because he aspired after the approval of men, but because he believed the word of God and knew who made the promise and that he could back it up and that he would. The same was true for Abraham who was promised descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. Abraham didn't believe that promise because Sarah was in, in the best shape of her life and ready to give children. She was barren. No, Abraham was a pagan worshiping the moon rock. He certainly didn't believe God because he had seen enough miracles that God put before his eyes. Abraham didn't believe God because there was enough evidence to convince him. Oh, Abraham believed the word of God because God made it clear, I'm God. Look at the stars. Abraham knew who made the promise. He knew he could back it up. That word itself delivered faith to Abraham. It is not faith that makes something trustworthy. It is the existence of a trustworthy object that creates faith. Hebrews 6 says, when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, God swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having waited patiently, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. 
We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor for our soul. This word of God because it is God's word. I hope I don't have to convince you of this, but every year about this time when you start hearing a specific kind of ad over and over and over again on the radio, I feel it necessary. There's nothing in no one in this world that has or that can be worthy of your faith and trust entirely. There is no promise from any perishing man, no promise from any perishing wealth, no promise from any president that's worthy of your absolute trust and faith. There is only one who is worthy of your faith the one who has come from outside of a perishing world. Because that's, that's what makes him great. We don't put our faith in things that are here because we all know they perish, as grand and great as they are. No, one worthy of our faith has to come from outside of this perishing world. And that's who Jesus is, the Son of God of heaven itself. Come into this sinful world, for this sinful world, to bring a true reason for hope and faith because of who he is. Our only hope of living after death is to place our faith in the only one who has revealed himself to have that authority. The one who said, despite no one really believing in him at the time, I'm gonna suffer and die and exactly three days later I'm gonna come back from the dead. And despite people laughing at him, despite his own disciples trying to stop him, his word is truth. His authority stands alone, and that's what he did. He rose. Not only does his word prove true for us, but it is his word that even silences and rebukes evil, as we read in our text for today. Like Abraham and Noah and the many faithful before them, in Mark chapter 1, we see the disciples being called to believe in, and not just believe in, but follow the word of God that has come to them for no other reason than it is the word of God. As has always been the case, because of the wickedness of the world, that word of God comes into the midst of chaos, comes into the midst of suffering and persecution. That word of God comes into the midst of sinners because it came for sinners, to forgive sinners. Mark tells us in verse 14 through 15, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You have to sit with that for a minute to really get the power of what Mark's telling you. It was after John the Baptist was arrested, thrown in jail for sharing his faith, for being a Christian, thrown in jail for proclaiming the kingdom of God. That's the moment Jesus shows up and begins his ministry. That's when Jesus shows up in the midst of hostility, in the midst of John the Baptist in prison. And at first glance, you wonder why Jesus chose that time. The kingdom of God is here. Well, then why is John in prison? I thought the kingdom of God was here. Oh, indeed it is. I think that's exactly why Jesus at this time chooses not only to start his public ministry, but to do so echoing the words of John the Baptist. Repent, because the kingdom's here. It is not a kingdom that even Herod, with all of his might and wealth, can threaten, even if you put John or a hundred other followers in prison. No, the Lord alone holds the authority. The word of God has come to bring about faith and repentance, and Herod can't stop it. And it's not just hostility from the, the physical world that this word of God came into. Mark tells us that immediately, after calling the disciples, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, 
saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. You gotta imagine that scene if you can. A demon in church possessing someone. Jesus coming, commanding him to leave, and the spirit honestly doesn't want to. That's why he was convulsing and screaming. But he doesn't have a choice. The Holy One has spoken, and so out he goes. This shows us that God's word will not be stopped by the wickedness of men, by the devil himself, or by death itself. For that is what this word of God came to do, to defeat death by taking it on. And the fact that Jesus calls his disciples to leave everything and now follow him in the midst of such chaos and hostility should give you and I hope even in the day in which we live. I think Professor David Schmidt communicates this comfort and hope we have well when he says, this is comforting for us because we have seen how our cultural setting has become hostile towards Christianity. We're not being put to death like Christians in other parts of the world, but we are publicly mocked for our beliefs on TV, social media, and during protests. It makes one nervous. How can I enter into that world and live as a believer? Christianity here is much easier if I just reduce it to a teaching and something I do for an hour or two on Sunday. It's always easier to quote someone else when you have to drop the heavy bad news, right? <laughs> it is easier to live as a Christian just two hours or so on Sunday. It is easier to live as a Christian when you reduce that Christianity to a weekend ritual. But I assure you that Christianity is not more fulfilling. That Christianity is not more joyful. That Christianity, though it may be void of suffering, is not more satisfying. Following Jesus with all of our life is what brings what we're looking for. Because we don't want Jesus to just save part of us, do we? And yet, why do we only bring him part? He desires to save all of it. Not just one day, two days. Jeffrey A. Gibbs, I think, has some appropriate words. Jesus does not present himself in any sense as an augment to our own present independent existence, as an add-on or only part of our lives. It is folly and destruction to think that old wine skins can serve as containers for new wine. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are his now and forever. The great reality is that God's reign in Jesus has broken into a sinful world to reclaim and save all of it and finally to renew it forever. What is it that propelled these disciples to literally drop everything where they stood? Even, it's comical when you read it, leaving their dad with the servants in the boat and just immediately running after Jesus. Well, it was clear that he spoke with authority. They had already heard him teach. They had heard some miracles. They had seen that this is exactly who John the Baptist said he was. And so with that authority, when the Lord calls, when he says, follow me, when he speaks, what else do you do if you're a disciple? You follow. When he calls, where he goes. Luke gives us a bit more detail about what happened when Jesus called the disciples to go on mission with him. Luke says, when they had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats, so they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at his knees, and he said to Jesus, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. 
From now on, you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Certainly, Peter and the rest of the disciples didn't follow Jesus because of what they had seen. They just saw a miracle. And what did it cause within them? Conviction. Jesus performs a miracle of fish and says, follow me. And what does Peter say? Uh, Depart from me, Lord. I'm I'm not worthy to follow you. So clearly, the disciples weren't following Jesus because of their great faith. No, they were simply following him because he is the great one. He has the authority. And when he speaks, it happens. Ultimately, Jesus called the disciples to follow him, to follow his steps, his way, his word. He asked them to follow him with all that they had, everything. Because he, in and of himself alone, is enough. I've shared it with you before, but one of my favorite choruses in a Christian song comes from Elias Doomer. The song's called Enough, and the chorus says, even with nothing, I still have everything, because Jesus, you are enough for me. What one thing in your life that you have labored for, that you have truly sacrificed for, that you have put in overtime or stayed up all night for? What one of those things that you have given so much of yourself to promises you eternal joy and satisfaction? None of it can unless it's for and from him. Only two types of people exist in a cemetery, living or dead ones, There's no stronger, there's no weaker, there's no more or less successful in a cemetery. Do we think that we would be disappointed if we labored for Christ as hard as we do for material things? Do we think he would be disappointing to us in his faithfulness if we dared to sacrifice the full tithe? Do we think that we would suffer in vain if we were given the privilege to suffer even persecution? For the sake of the gospel? No, my friends, there's nothing that would prove to be in vain if it's done for him, if it's done with him, following his time, his way, his thoughts, with our hands and feet, with our desires and aspirations. There's no one worthy of our time, effort, energy, no one worthy of our pain or our sacrifice more than him, Jesus, who's already given everything for you and me. I think it's interesting that when Jesus calls his disciples, he doesn't tell them, follow me and stop doing that silly fishing stuff. Why are you wasting your time with that? No, what he says is, follow me. We're going to keep fishing. I'm just going to change the bait and change the catch. God doesn't always call us to abandon everything to follow him. Most of the time, if we're listening... God comes to us right where we're at in your life today with your job, with your stuff, with your family, with your situation, and he just says, follow me because he is the Lord, because everything comes from him, because he is enough, because he is everything. Amen. Let's pray.